Yeah. Right here? Yeah. Tap, 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 tap. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is David Craig. I'm a uh, clinical professor at USC Annenberg in the School of Communication and Journalism. I'm also a visiting scholar here at BKC and the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Thank you all for joining us today for our RSM Speaker Series. And I'm here to introduce our speaker for the day, who's a friend, a colleague, and um, very much a co-conspirator in this new field of creator studies that we've been carving out. So a brief introduction, and then I'll turn it over to you. Dr. Zoe Glapp is a feminist media scholar with interest in platformized creative industries and labor, social media and influencer cultures, and digital ethnographic methods. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New England, where she is currently working on her first book, Demonetized, Inequality, Co-Option, and Resistance in the Influencer Industry. She is also co-founder of the Digital Ethnographic Collective, an interdisciplinary group exploring the intersections of digital culture and ethnographic methods, and is currently in the process of setting up a new research network for scholars of social media content creators. Watch Thank this you. space. Yes, <laughs> yes, we. I love it. Um, and um, without any further ado, Thank you so much for joining us today. And after this, we will have um, time for Q&A, both in-house and online. Thank you, David. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. Uh, thanks, David, for inviting me. Um, I really hope that you'll find this interesting. I'm just down the road at Microsoft um, in the Social Media Collective, so uh, I think there's probably quite a lot of connections and relationships between those two groups. Um, so it's nice to come here and just like get more involved with what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm doing a talk um, which I'm calling We All Have the Power to Create the World We Want, Platforms, Creators and the Co-Option of Social Justice Narratives. Um, I'm drawing on two pieces of research for this talk. Uh, firstly, my PhD research, which I, I finished my PhD at the London School of Economics about four, five months ago, um, woo, <laughs> which was um, a, a very long-term, multi-year ethnographic study of the influence industry in London, um, particularly thinking about um, labour, platformized creative labour and inequality uh, in the influencer industry. And um, that involved a lot of offline and also online um, field work. I also became a YouTube creator myself, um, and I did a lot of interviews with creators across a very wide range of genres. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, and then I'm also drawing on a chapter that I co-authored with Professor Sarah Vinay Weiser for the Rutledge Companion to um, Intersectionalities. Uh, which was about the branding of intersectionality. So I'm kind of bringing those two things together in this talk today. Um, I hope that you find it interesting and uh, I hope that we'll have some interesting discussion afterwards. I know David is also working in, in some similar areas, thinking about similar questions at the moment. So I feel like there's, there's a lot of overlap between the work that we're doing. Okay, it's working. Right, um, so in January 2018, I attended my first um, offline fieldwork event. Um, I was very lucky to get access to this particular field site. It was the Creators for Change Summit, which was run by YouTube. Um, these are the Creators for Change fellows who were there that year. This was in 2018. Um, and the Creators for Change uh, program was basically a program, um, well, I'll tell you, it says here. It was set up in, in September 2016. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was set up then to uh, support the next generation of emerging creators using their voice for good on YouTube with a wide range of topics, including hate, xenophobia, and extremism, as well as race and gender. The fellows uh, were eligible to pitch to receive funding to support uh, and support from YouTube to film projects in line with their the, the initiative. And um, every year they had a summit in a different part of the world. Um, this year the summit was in London. And um, for the summit, YouTube basically flew the fellows as well as other interested stakeholders like people working for NGOs and policy experts um, to London to hear and participate in talks and to network with each other. Um, I just 
I got access to this event through like a very a, a chance. Uh, it was very lucky. Basically, my supervisor was invited, Sonia Livingston. She was working on policy stuff, and she didn't want to go, so she was like, "Do you want to go?" And I was like. Yes, <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so it was my first experience going to an event that was run by a platform, and it, it, it's very difficult to get access to those kinds of spaces. So I kind of saw it as a, a real opportunity to like meet some of the creators that I wanted to enlist as participants in my field work. So on the first day, I showed up at 9.30 to the Oval Space in Bethnal Green, which is like a very trendy part of East London. What struck me immediately was how fashionable and branded the space was. We were in a large room with high ceilings. On one side, there was a bar where attendees of the summit could get very good quality coffee with, of course, a choice of cow soy and almond milk, fancy green juices, hipster breakfast foods like chia seed pudding, which I feel has kind of gone down in trendiness now. But at the time, it was <laughs> in the higher trendings, um, all for free. There were very expensive looking gold reusable water bottles for attendees to take rather than plastic or paper cups, giving the impression that YouTube is an eco-minded and conscientious organisation in line with the marketing of the event. The walls were white with slick graphic art and video screens showcasing YouTubers videos. On one wall there was a large YouTube play logo that the attendees were taking pictures of in front of for their social media feeds. I found words like privilege, wealth, plush, exclusive and corporate running through my mind. I looked at the program for the day. At the top, there was a blurb outlining creators, change, creators for Change as a global initiative that supports creators like you, creators who are tackling social issues and promoting awareness, tolerance and empathy on their YouTube channels. Because no matter what kind of videos we make, we all have the power to help create the world we want. The programme also contained information about the food, coffee and artwork providers for the event, with blurbs outlining their ethical credentials. For example, the catering company was described as an award-winning social enterprise that showcases the culinary talents and cultural heritages of migrant and refugee women. And the coffee provider, I thought this was really ridiculous, um, claimed to transport and employ people affected by homelessness, that's not ridiculous, um, bringing people together by tackling homelessness one espresso at a time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, who said that was a good idea? <laughs> I don't know. Um, much like giving out the reusable water bottles, the decision to use these ethical providers and to present them prominently in the programme struck me as part of a very concerted marketing effort on part of YouTube to paint themselves as deeply principled. I felt a general scepticism. Um, that only became more pronounced as the day went on, that the Creators for Change initiative tried to de deal with a bizarre catch-all array of issues without actually putting these issues into conversation with one another. Um, programmed to strongly steer away from any controversy or disagreement between the attendees and encouraging impassioned but safe and very self-congratulatory exchanges about empowerment and changing the world through media. And this isn't to say anything negative about the, the fellows themselves who were all doing really great work, but it was more about like why was YouTube wanting to do this, right? We can see similar logics in the marketing around Pride Month, when platforms such as YouTube, TikTok, Instagram and Twitch display their commitment to the LGBTQ plus community, uh, spotlighting prominent creators and announcing fun new features and tools. It's usually very light, very fun, very colourful. These are pictures that I took during my field work um, when I was at VidCon London, yeah, VidCon London 2019. Um, at these events, there's always like these backstage areas that are, are put on by platforms and they're kind of exclusive spaces that you have to get an invite into uh, where platforms try to kind of sell themselves to the creators. Um, so in my PhD, I wanted to understand what the actual lived experiences and labour conditions for content creators are beyond public perceptions and industry discourses or marketing. So my research was driven by two core research questions. Um, firstly, what are the distinctive socio-cultural, technological and commercial factors that shape the experiences of content creators working in the influencer industry? And secondly, which creators are able to gain visibility and success, and conversely, who is systematically excluded from opportunities? Um, so, of course, my research um, is striving to understand the ways in which 
identity categories such as race, gender, ability, sexuality, and class impact creators' ability to gain success in this space. Um, in line with other critical and feminist scholars, uh, I found that contrary to the highly celebratory industry discourses that position social media platforms as diverse and meritocratic, there are complex and compounding um, exclusions and inequalities emerging around these different uh, socio-cultural, technological and commercial structures. Um, and in the next few slides, I'm going to give you an overview of some of my findings that kind of outline some of the labour conditions in the industry. So, firstly, um, technological inequalities. Um, marginalised creators face algorithmic discrimination, which is well documented, and I feel like people here probably know about this literature. Um, I define it as a process whereby certain content identities and positionalities within the platform economy are deprioritised from recommendation in an industry where visibility is key to success. So, for example, LGBTQ plus YouTube creators have faced widespread demonetization over the years for supposedly not being advertiser and family friendly, although platforms deny that that's the case. Um, so scholar Carolina R, for example, has written extensively about the negative impacts of shadow banning on creators deemed not safe for work like pole dancers. And BIPOC creators routinely re report that their content is not recommended widely on the grounds of race. You might remember this story, um, which where, where Naomi Nicholas Williams, who is a, an Instagram model, kept getting this photo taken down um, when she wasn't showing any more skin than many other creators show who weren't getting taken down, and it, it caused quite a lot of um, protest on the platform. So in this video essay, you might recognize Khadija Mboe, she's quite a big video essayist, uh, or bread tuber. Um, she discusses the colorism that she experiences as a darker skinned black woman on YouTube, where audiences' implicit bias towards lighter skinned creators in turn become algorithmic bias that determines who is seen and not seen on the platform. So as she says in the video, these algorithms are simply just doing their job. If you mostly watch content by creators who are on the beige spectrum, that's all it's going to keep feeding you. As Sarah Benet Weiser and I argued in our chapter in the book Creator Culture, which was edited by David and Stuart Cunningham, platforms algorithms are designed to render some content more visible than others, and the logic of this asymmetry is based on profitability. Which leads me to the next set of inequalities, which are commercial inequalities. Um, you might recognise Victoria McGrath, also known as In The Fro. She's like a very um, high-profile British um, lifestyle and beauty influencer um, who does a lot of brand deals with like huge designer, designer brands. So one of my interviewees was Joe Burford, who at the time was the head of creative solutions at top-tier influencer marketing agency Whaler. Um, she's now the, the UK head of community at TikTok. I feel like I need to reconnect with her because that's pretty interesting. Um, so I asked her, she was actually the only influencer marketing person that I interviewed. I just, she had so many interesting things to say, but I was just like, I have to talk to you more formally. Um, I asked her if she thought that there was a diversity problem in influencer marketing. And she said that there's a great deal of diverse talent um, on social media platforms, but are they being monetized? Are they the ones that get picked for panels? I think that mainstream brands have a hell of a lot more to do. I think that a lot of them have an unconscious bias towards safe campaigns. And when I say safe, I mean pretty blonde girl holding my product sitting on the beach. They've seen it work before and they want to do it again. And even when marginalized creators do get selected for brand campaigns, they're often paid considerably less, if at all. And it's important to just say here that uh, there are many ways that content creators make money, and in, that indeed they're, they're told to diversify their income streams because it's such a precarious job, but brand deals are still by far the, the, the biggest source of income for creators. So if you aren't able to get brand deals or you don't get much from brand deals, then it's very hard to survive as a, as a content creator. So in a, in a Guardian article, Nicole Ockren, who's the founder of the Creators Union, which is a, an organisation in the UK, um, explained that LGBTQ plus creators, disabled creators, plus size creators, and black and brown influencers are constantly being asked to work for free. According to a 2018 study of YouTube that 
some of you may have read, 97% uh, of all aspiring content creators on the platform did not make it above the US poverty line of $12,000 a year, with only 3% making a living wage. Um, so within this context, a study conducted by MSL and the Influencer League in 2021 found that in the USA, there is a stark racial pay gap in the influencer industry, as high as 35% between white and black influencers which according to the agency vastly overshadows the racial pay gaps in any other industry, which is quite an incredible statistic. So outside of the occasional diversity initiatives uh, during Pride Month and Black History Month, um, me and Sarah argued that this is an advertising driven industry that makes visible the most profitable creators, those who do not disrupt the neoliberal status quo, white, straight, male, middle class, heteronormative, cisgendered, and most importantly, brand friendly. We also see um, industry, what I mean by industry inequalities is this, these things that I noticed when I was doing field work at industry events. Um, this is a picture that I took at Summer in the City in 2018, um, which this is the creator meeting routes. If any of you have been to these kinds of events, like people, fans queue up because they want to get a picture with their favorite influencer. So, so conventions like Summer in the City and VidCon, which is the big one, I also went to VidCon in LA or Anaheim a couple of times. I think, did we meet there? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> VidCon in, in Anaheim is huge. It's like 75,000 people go to it. Um, City is a bit smaller, but it's still, it's the biggest one in the UK. And I went there three times during my field work. Um, so they're really important spaces for content creators. They're, not only are they opportunities for creators to interact with their fans and also other creators, which is like a really important networking opportunity, but also industry people like um, talent managers, people who work for platforms, and very importantly, um, like marketing executives who get to choose which creators to invite onto brand campaigns. Um, but I found that there are really complex intersections here between economic opportunities and what we might call like cultural fit. Um, so it became really clear over going to quite a few of these events that the kind of core um, community of creators that always got invited to these events were predominantly white middle class creators working across a range of different types of genres, but those that was usually the demographic. Um, and and one of my key participants, Taha Khan, he was the um, PALS coordinator at Summer in the City, which meant that he was the person who invited creators to come and um, sit on panels. He was the person who chose who those people were. Um, and he was someone who felt really passionately about increasing the diversity of the UK creative community, but he really struggled to make that happen over the years. Um, I, he gave, he said it really well in, well I thought it was really interesting in an interview I did with him, he said, sorry for the big quote, um, there were a couple of non-white creators who would come to City and just feel very alienated and not want to come again. What was happening was that entire cohesive social groups from white communities were coming, so you had all of the white blogging creators, all of the white gaming creators, but then when it came to diversity, people were being plucked from very different social groups, so they didn't have any friends, and it created a bad dynamic in the green room. And um, what was worse than this was that a lot of, uh, in the first year that I was doing field work in 2018, there was um, a particular um, rupture with this because a lot of black creators were finding that the people who were working as stewards, which was like a volunteer role, they didn't recognize them because they weren't fans of theirs. So they weren't letting them into the green room and there was like issues with, with creators getting stopped at the door and having to get out their ID and all this kind of stuff. So it, it was just like a very bad vibe basically for these creators. Um, Taha said that these social barriers led him to feeling that facilitating a more meaningfully diverse UK creative community was a lost cause. And so his mission changed to simply getting any smallish up and coming black or brown creator on a panel because then they're on the website and marketing people just look at the website. So even if he was not able to create significant sociocultural change, at least he could use his power to try and help minority creators to gain access to coveted economic opportunities in the industry. 
Um, as with other creative industries, informal hiring practice are deeply entrenched in online video. It's more about who you know and not what you know. Um, and we see this all the time if you think about the, the importance of collapse, you know, that's like such a fundamental thing in this industry, um, sharing audiences with other creators. Um, so networking is really an absolutely essential way in which creators access work and income. Um, and as Ross Gill has argued about um, previous or legacy cultural industries, this informality raises grave concerns for equal opportunities, uh, exacerbated by the lack of transparency in the process. And then uh, finally, we have audience inequalities. Um, so as many scholars have noted, uh, the careers of social media content creators live or die by their ability to cultivate an invested audience community. Um, so they really try to, to practice um, what Nancy Ben calls relational labor, which is basically cultivating an intimate and authentic persona, which you have also written about. I feel like you're in my line of sight, so I'm like, <laughs> David's written about all of this too. Um, uh, and that's really important for content creators. It's like, you know, most people studying content creators agree that it's like a very fundamental and interesting thing about this type of labor, that kind of um, intimate relationship that creators have with their audiences. Um, but the tolls of managing these audience relationships is higher for marginalized creators, especially those who make not safe for, for work content or critical leftist and feminist um, content, who are much more likely to be targets of ridicule, hate, harassment and doxing. Um, in her book, How to Stay Safe Online, Seiyi Akiwowo draws on a sad but unshocking set of statistics. Um, so women are 27% more likely than men to be harassed online. Black women are 84% more likely to be harassed than white women. There has been a 71% rise in online disability abuse and 78% of LGBTQ plus people have experienced hate speech online. So to give an example, you, you may or may not recognize Ash Hardell, who's probably the most famous trans or binary creator in the Western context. Um, they released this video titled Trauma, Transphobia and the Internet, Why I Left for Two and a Half Years um, in 2021, I think this video was released, um, in which they talked about the extensive trolling, harassment and doxing that they've been subjected to, which actually caused them to, to leave for two and a half years. Um, Ash is an example of a creator who has a very strong audience community and encourages intimacy by self-disclosure. Um, but, but they describe how YouTube's algorithms recommended their videos to transphobic audiences, which means that the self-disclosure intended for their own audience became ammunition for anti-fans. So in this video essay, they say, I'm worried that by opening up and sharing my story and confessing to some of my personal self-doubts and struggles in the process, folks may try to weaponize those disclosures against me later. So I, I found that there's a catch-22 here for marginalized creators who find themselves in what I call an intimacy triple bind. Um, these creators face systemic technological and commercial exclusions, as I talked about in the previous slides. Uh, so they therefore have to rely more heavily on crowdfunding as, as their model for income generation, um, which means it's really important that they perform this relational labor and have or, that can cultivate audiences that want to support them financially. Um, but for these creators who are already at high risk from hostile audiences, performing this relational labor can open them up to further harms in the form of weaponized intimacy. So I want to return here now to, to what platforms are doing, right? So in the summer of 2020, following the murder of George Floyd, we saw anti-racist and intersectional politics move from the margins and into mainstream discourse with the heightened global visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement. Alongside many other industries, this moment gave rise to impassioned conversations about racial inequality in the influencer industry. And some of the dynamics that I've talked about uh, in the previous slides gained a lot of um, attention, wider attention in the industry. At this time, it was halfway through my PhD, um, I noticed a radical shift in how platforms were framing themselves discursively, no longer as neutral vessels for content, as Tolton Gillespie uh, posited in his influential argue the politics of article, sorry, the politics of platforms in 2010. 
In 2020, social media platforms felt obligated to release statements publicly supporting Black Lives Matter. Unlike the Creators for Change program and Pride Month marketing that I mentioned earlier, at this time, platforms actually took accountability for the role that they were playing themselves in perpetuating racial inequalities amongst creators and users. So, for example, um, Adam Masseri, the head of Instagram, posted this letter titled Ensuring Black Voices Are Heard. Uh, to Instagram's blog on the 15th of June 2020, in which he acknowledged the irony that Instagram as a platform stands for elevating black voices while simultaneously being a space where black people are often harassed, afraid of being shadow banned, and disagree with many content takedowns. Further, he highlighted how Instagram is striving to be inclusive to other groups, such as LGBTQ plus people and body positive activists that have been historically marginalized on the platform. And several longer term initiatives uh, emerged after that point that sought to tackle racial inequalities, uh, such as uh, the YouTube Black Voices Fund in 2020, which was a multi-year multi program dedicated to supporting and funding black creators on the platform. And TikTok took a similar strategy with its Black Creator Trailblazers program in 2021, designed to nurture and develop 30 talented emerging black creators, musicians and artists in order to celebrate the black community on the platform. So what can we make of all this? I've been really like racking my brain over the last few years about like, what does it mean that there are these, we know what the, the, the labor conditions are for creators. We know there's inequality that is perpetuated in many ways. We also know that platforms seem to be trying to respond to those issues. And that seems like a good thing, right? Like we, it's, it's good. It seems to be good. Um, but I still have the, had this feeling that it was like, is it really, you know, is it really changing? Is it actually getting better? Is this a good thing that's happening right now in the industry? Um, and and more, most importantly, does it actually mean positive change for marginalized creators, right? So whilst on the surface level, these platform diversity initiatives appear to be commendable, when we look closer, we can see that they couch social change within a commercial system that through the spectacular visibility of diversity, an approach that buys into the all too familiar values of individualism, positivity and a can do attitude, rather than anything that would hurt the bottom line of platforms. And I just want to add a side note here that I know people who work at these platforms who are really committed to increasing diversity and really do care a lot. But here I'm more interested in like, stepping back and looking at the whole, the structure as a whole, right? So as Faith Day has argued about YouTube Black, we need to distinguish Black YouTube on the one hand, which he defines as a reflection of an African-American cyber culture, and hashtag YouTube Black on the other, which is a reflection of corporate culture. As she points out, the creators selected for YouTube Black were already popular Black YouTube celebrities, those who do not disrupt the status quo or deal with overtly political topics. Francesca Savande has done really amazing work, if, if you're interested in this topic. Um, she coined the term woke washing in 2019 uh, to describe the various marketing campaigns that draw on feminism, anti-racism and social justice to market and sell products. As she argues, this type of strategy upholds the neoliberal idea that achievement, social change and overcoming inequality requires individual ambition and consumption rather than structural shifts and resistance. What unites all of these initiatives is the reactive way in which corporate culture responded to the popular and political energy behind Black Lives Matter in 2020. They ut utilize anti-racism and intersectionality as a branding exercise only when they have something to gain from it and not at other times. So this is content creator Nathan Zed. Um, he put, he had a video, uh, this video here. Oh, you can't see the bottom here, but it, this video was called Black Lives Matter it's trendy now, um, which he released in 2020. And he said, we're in a phase where it's basically like there's a monetization of Black Lives Matter, a commodification of Black Lives Matter. There's something profoundly amiss when it becomes financially and reputationally advantageous for corporations to critique their own privilege in a capitalist, racist and misogynist system. By branding themselves as committed to social justice causes at times when consumers expect them to do so, platforms accrue social, cultural, and economic capital. Oh, my notes are huge on this page. 
Um, in 2020, it became a financial necessity for companies to speak up about Black Lives Matter. But as the momentum behind the movement simmered down, at least temporarily, uh, so too did the branding response. So it's not really in the economic interest of private companies to challenge the very power structures upon which they thrive. Uh, the fickleness with, with which companies picked up these issues and dropped them once the public appetite had waned speaks to the way in which the branding of intersectionality operates uh, as all surface and no substance. The politics of anti-racism and intersectionality are co-opted as a veneer for change, but not at the cost of profit. So as Nathan Zed puts at the end of his video, just a reminder for some people who are going to be done after this week and never have to think about black people again until the next time this blows up. Some of you guys can do that and the rest of us are still going to be black. In the 2017 lecture, Angela Davis reflected on the fundamental disconnection between capitalism as a structure and the progressive uh, intersectional politics of anti-racism and feminism. And I, I just wanted to share um, her words in closing. If we stand up against racism, we want much more than inclusion. Inclusion is not enough. Diversity is not enough. And as a matter of fact, we do not wish to be included in a racist society. If we say no to heteropatriarchy, then we do not want to be assimilated into a misogynist and heteropatriarchal society. If we say no to poverty, we do not want to be contained by a capitalist structure that values profits more than human beings. In the current moment, we're seeing a significant rise in the commodification and branding of social justice discourses. It's tempting to believe that this marks progress in society in as much as intersectional politics have become so mainstream that even corporate culture has jumped on the bandwagon. But initiatives like YouTube Black steer away from the strong anti-capitalist sentiment in the Black Lives Matter movement, instead embracing neoliberal discourses that fuse positive social change with exceptionalism and capitalist accumulation. As I've argued today, in a capitalist society where major corporations trade on their images of defenders of social justice, anti-racist messages have become yet another commodity to be packaged by marketing and PR executives, incapable of providing any meaningful challenge to existing inequitable relations of power. Thank you. All right. I should have put my Twitter 20. and my email address at the end, but then I thought it felt a bit, a bit, um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, we know how to find you online, obviously, but obviously yeah. we can also <laughs> score your emails from here. But um, sure. you are a YouTube creator after all, oh. so we can still track you through your performances on YouTube or your community on YouTube. So um, I'm going to um, thank you again for coming. And um, I know a big portion of the room here um, personally, but also know that they're already fluent in creatorlish. Um, but I don't know who's online, so yeah. I'm going to, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to do just a, a little bit of basic ground clearing to say, how would, are, are you using the terms influencer creator and content creator interchangeably, or do these mean something different? Yeah, well, it's a good question, an age-old question that we like to talk 15 about. years now we've been <laughs> Um, I, whenever people ask me this, I always point them towards, um, I can take these off because my eyes are funny. I always point them towards um, Sophie Bishops. Have you read her yeah. article? Was it in Real Life magazine? Um, it's called Name of the Game, I think. I can share it if anyone's interested. But it was just like, it was a great piece. She should really publish it as an article, a journal article. But she talks about this distinction between like creep content creator and influencer. And, and she says, it's funny how like these different terms people get really caught up on like one meaning one thing and the other meaning something else, but actually they're basically describing the same job. Both content creators and influencers make money, they, they put content online, they make money through different revenue streams. And she was, for her, she was saying that it's really a gendered thing where influencers denotes a certain type of culture, which is like feminized and vapid and vain. It's to do with products and stuff, whereas content creator kind of evokes this like artistic, creative, like positive associations more often associated with male genres, she argues. I think that's a great piece, but basically I use them interchangeably. I just use the, the terms that the creators use, but they tend to use content creator in, in public facing contexts and influencer in like industry facing contexts. 
So just to, by the way, I'm still asking these at the beginning of all my research interviews. Yeah. I can't wait to the day when I don't have to ask these questions. But just to differentiate these, would these include game players, for example, over on live streaming platforms? And alternatively, are they different from what, uh, how Hollywood refers to themselves now as creators over in the film television yeah. streaming space? I, I, I would use content creator as a very catch-all term to include any like internet-based creator. I, my, my participants ranged very widely, including gamers, um, video essayists, lifestyle, fitness, you know, um, short filmmakers, which is a more of an unusual one. Um, all sorts, you know, daily bloggers and stuff like that. I use it very broadly. I don't know about the Hollywood question. I would like to know what you think about that. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll tag that on later. I'm not going to waste. Uh, we have t loads of questions for you, by the way. Okay. So let me just ask you more targeted questions around this particular research. Um, uh, as you're probably more aware than almost any of them in the world, actually, is the emergence of these new labor rights movements by creators. There's uh, guilds and unions and, and, and all these organizations that are trying in many ways to try to create more sustainable, less precarious conditions, both on the platforms, but also with the brands and the advertising side. What do you think about the emergence of these groups? What are the challenges that they face? Will they be effective? Yes, good question. Um, I, I think they're very interesting. I'm actually writing a piece of, or working on a piece of moment with Sophie Bishop about the, the emergence of these unions and stuff. Uh, I think the language is really interesting. Like in the UK, they tend to be unions, or in the UK and Europe, in America, they tend to be guilds and associations, which is interesting, um, and kind of points to the different politics that they, they draw on in, in what they're doing. Um, but actually, I think, well, I thought that a question you might ask, or that someone might ask is, so what, what should be happening, or what should platforms be doing if these things are not effective? And my answer would be, to actually like recognize and pay attention to those labor organizations because they don't generally. The, I think the only one they did was the Internet Creators Guild, which was, you know, you know about them, but they were a, a guild in, from 2016 to 19 uh, that was started by Hank Green. So like they really had some really big creators on their board and stuff like that. So they had the ear of YouTube particularly. Um, but most of these groups are not recognized at all by platforms, um, which seems very problematic. Um, but yeah, they're, they're doing good things. They're doing different things. There's a new one that's just started, um, which was, is more to do with TikTok creators. Um, but generally, they have great challenges because of the like geographic fragmentation of creators and also the the um, regulation, like the fact that they're all creators in different countries are living under different regulatory structures. Um, so these companies are based in America, but what happens to a creator who's in the UK? Can they, like, how do they enact change? It's just very fragmented, so it's really difficult. I always thought it was amazing that YouTube actually did, came out and announced that they would disregard anything from the German YouTube for good group that came out. They yeah. put out a statement saying, we're not interested in yeah. those labor rights questions yeah, that they crazy. keep raising. It's yeah. just a small little yeah. contingent. Well, and fair to you, that was Jorgis Brava. Right. Uh, he, he, um, he did, it was the YouTubers Union, and he had a thing called Fair, the Fairtube campaign, and he, um, I will acted as a consultant for them, oh. um, but he, um, they're an interesting case because they actually attached to IG Metall, which was like one of the huge trade unions in Germany. Uh, so they actually were doing it in a real like union, union -y way, and YouTube was just like, no. Nope, not interested. <laughs> not at all. So speaking of platforms, um, you, we've now seen the, um, the uh, ways in which the platforms have used the work that creators are already doing in these spaces, including the marginalized spaces, um, to then, of course, draw greater attention to them as a platform. It's a kind of corporate diplomacy, which is not unique to any corporation or this particular field. But what role do you possibly see platforms ever playing in trying to advocate for or create greater opportunity or fairness and equitable conditions for these creators while still serving their core capitalist right. profit mode? I think it's, it's very difficult. Like, I mean, they, they, 
you might have heard about the adpocalypse, which was like a big thing in 2017, I think, which was when, well, there have been multiple adpocalypses, but the big one was 2017 when um, I think um, adverts got shown next to like terrorist videos and then all the, uh, lots of the huge advertisers pulled out of YouTube. Um, and it caused absolute chaos for creators because basically YouTube tightened up its algorithmic system that determined what should be shown next to adverts, which had the terrible knock-on effect for especially smaller creators who all got demonetized because it was like not worth the risk for YouTube to put, put adverts on those videos because it was very difficult for them to determine whether or not they were uh, safe, safe for advertisers. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think a lot of people in our field have drawn on that example because it's just, a, it really shows the different stakeholders and how they interact with each other and how they, the push and pull kind of factors of those different, those three, the platforms, the advertisers and the creators. Um, I mean, the short answer is, it, I guess, if YouTube weren't so dependent on advertisers, or prioritize creators more <laughs> over, or maybe the balance of that, how they prioritize advertisers and creators was different, then it would be better for creators. A lot of creators felt that, that platforms just care about advertisers. But, I mean, obviously that's kind of, it's kind of baked into the system, isn't it? If your, your income is coming from advertisers, of course you're gonna privilege advertisers. Um, but then also, I mean, maybe platforms could put more pressure on advertisers to actually think about how, what kinds of creators they want to partner with, not just in terms of like pre-roll ads, but in terms of the brand deal. I feel like platforms have a lot of power actually to kind of put pressure on advertisers in that situation. So we'll open up to questions. One last question for you, and I don't know if you can speak as fluently, but I know you've been, you're very aware of Sophie's work in getting the UK has been perhaps one of the few jurisdictions to actually entertain creators as a class of labor and to engage more beyond just kind of these typical advertising endorsement guidelines that every country now has around what creators can and cannot do on the platforms. They've actually gone and, and entertained a more holistic account of what creators contribute to the economy, both economically and culturally. Could you speak a little about that sort of process and where that, that has where, where that's at in terms of the parliament and the I'm discussion. sure exactly where it's at now, but I mean, she ran a, an inquiry in the, to, with the UK government um, about influence and labour um, and drew on a lot of the work of people in our field, um, which supported the idea that this is, in fact, an important industry that needs to be paid attention to. I have, I didn't put it in this, this talk, but some of the statistics, the numbers around this industry are just like crazy. I think. Goldman Sachs had a, a report right like three months ago or something? Half a trillion dollars. Yeah. Was it half a trillion? Half a trillion. Was it not a quarter of a trillion? Half yeah, a trillion. It's now up to half. The you another week. Economy. Yeah, with right. no underlying evidence to support it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a pretty number. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure Goldman Sachs ever has to support their data, but okay. <laughs> yeah. But basically, the point of this inquiry was to just make sure that the government, the UK government understood how significant actually this industry is in terms of income generation, and that it should be treated as a, a serious cultural industry, um, like other cultural industries in the UK and around the world. Um, so they brought a lot of evidence in that supported the types of arguments that we make about, about labor, about uh, precarity and inequality. Um, but I don't know if anything, I mean, I don't think they've changed anything yet. You know, I think inquiries, they, these things are very slow, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's a good sign that a government cares uh, enough to do an inquiry because it's quite a lot of resources to put into it. Um, and I assume that might mean that other governments might also start to think about it more seriously. Well, and to that point, the new Digital Services Act that the EU just came out with has declared that the platforms have to be transparent when they demonetize mm. creators on platforms. Which is really interesting. However, they haven't actually asked or demanded that platforms be transparent about how they monetize the creators, right, right. which that is yeah. a whole other set of labor yeah. questions. Because that's always like uh, in these labor movements, one of the main kind of um, demands of creators is always to have more transparency to understand what's actually happening. Because that's, you know, a lot of bad things happen in the dark, like in these industries, like people don't really know uh, what's going on. So that's where, where you get you know, um, websites like Fuck You Pay Me, where creators put up 
um, that is the name. That is the name. <laughs> they submit the their experiences working with particular brands and how much they were paid for different campaigns so that other creators can, it's like a glass door kind of thing for creators working with brands so they can see how much should I be asking for, but also like, did they pay on time? What was the contract like? You know, they kind of, creators are sharing information to try and overcome some of this opacity. Mm. All right, so let's open it up to the room. Just trying to represent a few of the folks tuning in from That'd online. Uh, Laura mentioned the uh, book from Taylor Lorenz called Extremely Online. I'm wondering uh, if you have any thoughts or uh, have anything to complement that. Um, our um, good uh, uh, former visiting scholar, uh, Dr. Jabari Evans, uh, oh. mentioned that I, I, he wonders if whether the issue is whether social media is still too many talking to too many and whether there needs to be a digital safe spaces created by marginalized folks for marginalized folks mm -hmm. and if we're in theory over uh, overvaluing the imaginary of say black creators heavy messages reaching everyone versus reaching those who are safe around and also um christine tren um have questions regarding how does questions of ownership came up in your work at all, as in did creator aspires or imagine to own stakes alongside other creators in the platform companies that profit off of their content creation? So the connected with Barry Evans. Many other comments online, but I throw it back to you. Well, hello. I think you're over there. Um, <laughs> these are my friends. <laughs> Thank for your questions, friends. Um, <laughs> well, I think that 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 point actually about the having having smaller spaces where where minorities can get together and not feel exposed is, is a really interesting one. And I think that that's actually something that came up a lot when Twitter started to go down the pan and there were lots of new platforms being suggested, right? I can't remember the name of the, do you remember the name of this um, platform that came up that was like... Blue Sky? No. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it was a platform that was suggested for... kind of by, yeah, yeah. by black people, for black people, kind of. And, and it was like a really, in, some really interesting conversations there around how can we actually create online spaces that serve the people who want to use them. Um, in, my, in my work that I mentioned here on the Intimacy Triple Bind, I talked about how creators often kind of retreat away from public spaces, um, especially when they're at threat of, from like harassment and, and doxing. They want to cultivate smaller spaces where they can just be themselves and not have to worry so much. So people often use Patreon for stuff like that. Um, can you repeat Christine's question? Um, it's about ownership. Christine, yes, yeah. what's uh, about ownership? Did creators aspire or imagine to own stakes alongside other creators oh. in the platform companies that profit off of their yes. content creation? Where yes, does ownership do. fit in the imaginary of creator career aspiration? Yes, that's a good question. Actually, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because it keeps coming up. It came up at our workshop a couple of weeks ago. Have you guys heard of Nebula? It's, it was a platform that was started in um, 2000. 19, I think, 19. I heard about it at the time because I was doing field work and some of the creators that were my participants um, were part of Nebula, like the first round of people. But Nebula is basically a platform that's owned by creators. Um, and I've been meaning to look them up again because they've come up like three times in the last week. And I think it's a really interesting case study for one of the chapters of my book is about creator resistance. And I think like that's a really interesting different model that doesn't, you know, where where it's like a cooperative, basically, a cooperative platform. But at the moment, it's, I think it's mostly edge YouTubers. So the people I know who are really involved with it are like science creators and, and video essayists, um, which is cool. But anyway, yes, ownership is an interesting question. Um, but that's, that's the best example that I've heard of, which I think deserves some further scrutiny. All right, let's go around the room. See you've got some questions. If not, I've always got one. Thank you. There was a lot of work that you did in this research and that you conveyed to us. This is not an area I, I know in, so I have a, a pretty naive question to ask you, I think. You, you, um, you ob object to systematic bias in the compensation that creators are given, and you gave us the results of what it sounds like a very dramatic 
an impressive study showing that people of color, other marginalized creators, are not paid the same as um, as other creators are. What what is it that you would like to see in terms of the way this the scales or well, pay scales are defined? That it would be based on on market forces alone. In other words, you know the number of followers, number of views, number of hours that people view one video should translate into compensation, or there should be some other systematic approach that is not biased. Mm. And then I think I have another question, but I want to <laughs> yeah. see what your answer is. Yeah, uh, it's not a naive question at all. It's a really, it's really important. I think it's very easy to kind of um, point out the problems and it's much more difficult to actually come up with solutions um, to some of these issues because they're so complex and multifaceted. Um, at the moment, the way that brands usually um, decide how much they pay is based on metrics. So like viewer stats, you know, retention. It's not just viewers and subscribers, it's very fine grained um, detail about the, particularly the demographics of the audience of the person, um, which, which raises a lot of questions about, about uh, inequity, basically. Um, but I think, I think the point of my, of coming at this question from looking at the, the, the kind of compounding nature of the, these kind of technological and social and commercial inequalities is to say that like, it may seem that just just deciding on brand deals and stuff based on um, view accounts seems kind of fair because it's just like well it's just numbers you know but those numbers are impacted by so many other things and those you know it's not like uh, racism for example just pops up in this system it's that racism is inflected and kind of um, exacerbated in by this system so I feel. I don't know in terms of the fine grained details, but I feel that brands need to think a bit more carefully about about how they can equitably invite people and, and compensate people for their labour. Um, that isn't really just based on view accounts. But I think it's it's more a question of decoupling the income from those kind of metric driven systems and thinking. What is the labor that I'm asking this person to do and what value does that have to us as a brand? But that might seem naive because I mean, that's, you know, that is how the system works. They're trying to measure the output of like the, the kind of financial value of, of investing. Of course, if someone has 10 million followers and someone else has 10 followers, then they're going to pay more for the 10 million. Um, but that is why <laughs> this system just kind of perpetuates itself. So I don't know if that's a very satisfactory answer, but I think I think fundamentally it's about decoupling from that heavily metrically driven way of calculating payment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate I appreciate how research can help unearth problems. It's, it's, it's not the job of research to find solutions. That's the job of advocacy. The research finds problems and helps to find them, and, and that seems like what you are done and have have are doing and have done very successfully. And I appreciate that. I I lose sleep trying to figure. Based on what you have said, I'm very troubled on about how one would go about trying to embed values in these kinds of decisions. So I'm not advocating at all. It should just be open market and. and just based on metrics, I, I'm not advocating that at all. But I'm, I'm also aware that that there are uh, a lot of white supremacists online who have heavy draws and lots of followers mm -hmm. who are very commercially viable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so just by going on market forces, things would head in the direction that I personally would find objectionable. But I'm also, as we as we all know, we're, we're finding ourselves in a time when you started by saying that creators got together to think about creating for good, for the good of society, and right, and 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 this is this it it sounds it sounds altruistic, but it's politicized and it's complicated. This week, the good might be uh, having no Jews from the river to the sea, 
uh, by, by many people's accounts. And other people's accounts, there would be different solutions to very contentious issues. Once we start placing values into the equations, um, I wonder if we, it, I think it's foreseeable that we gain more problems than solutions in some ways. And so it, I, I'm interested if you have a response. I'm just, um, I guess I don't have so much of a question except asking if you have a response to this, but, but um, moving away from objective metrics into evaluating um, approaches strikes me as very, very difficult mm -hmm. and potentially troublesome. Yeah. I'm sure many wiser people have thought of that issue than I. Uh, and I wonder if you mm -hmm. can help me sleep at night. Thank you. Well, I guess I guess the first thing I would say is that there are values in the system that already exists. They're kind of capitalist values, but there I mean there are lots of values that undergird the current system. They're just not very overt. Um, except actually in the case of these sorts of um, campaigns where the values suddenly become very clear. Um, though inconsistent over time. Um, yeah, it's complicated. I mean, I think that the, the, the difficult thing is that these platforms, there are certain people who work at these platforms, the platforms are based in certain cultural contexts. Those cultural contexts have very particular <coughs> politics and culture, obviously. Um, but these platforms are used by people across the world. So when you have platforms that are trying to kind of promote certain values, but they don't necessarily match the values of the very diverse communities of people that are using them it does get very complicated and we can see why in that case platforms have historically tried to avoid um, being overtly political or putting very very overt values across that aren't very uncontroversial like you know very fluffy kind of nothingy values um, but i do find it there is there's something that kind of um, troubles me when, maybe similarly to you, where, um, in seeing platforms actually making statements about politics, because I feel like it's very cynical. Um, but as it happens in this case, I agree with the politics that they're promoting, um, but like I, I just don't think that they're necessarily the right people to, it, it just feels like it's just a, a marketing exercise. But. Um, I don't know. I think this is very complicated, but it's an important question for sure. I'm sure lots of people For have. the record, that keeps us up yeah, yeah. sleeping at night as well. So yeah, if you want, you can hang out with us at three in the morning when we're trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We do have one more question in the room, and I have three more questions online. I just wonder if we could just uh, uh, sure. go through these two blocks and then uh, yeah. finalize. Sure. Um, so Jordan is asking um, whether you know <coughs> any strategies of these marginalized communities to avoid being screened out slash deplatform instead of scaling back their presence online. Uh, TX Watson uh, is uh, asking if you could find activists working on marginalization in other com. How, how do you think that activists working on marginalization in other contexts empathize with the issues of faced by marginalized creators? So empathy from outside. And uh, the, the uh, Jonathan Bellock uh, is, uh, do you find any unique challenges or opportunities due to creators working across multiple large companies? Um, is it harder because of the fragmented decision making or their opportunity to drive change by highlighting the difference between platforms? Yeah. Wow, all really great questions and some more of my friends. Um, the, I think actually that that question about the fragmented um, nature of the platforms is really interesting because I, I, I wrote an, uh, an article for the International Journal of Communication a couple of years ago, that, um, which is it's called We're All Told Not to Put Our Eggs in One Basket. And there's a subheading that I can't remember because no one remembers the subheading um, where I talk about the cross platform nature of labor in the influencer industry. And in that one, I was talking much more about precarity and how it's really difficult because they're not employed, they're not employees of these platforms, they're kind of freelancers who just work across them. Um, but I never talked about the benefits actually that might come up with that system. I mean, a lot of creators said that they enjoy the freedom that comes with um, not being tied to any given platform and being able to kind of choose which one. It's like a kind of free market thing, I guess, but like choose which one is the most beneficial for them. And actually, you just sent me yesterday that the TikTok creator fund closing down, right? Which is 
very interesting. But anyway, different platforms have different models for how they compensate creators and different kind of opportunities for visibility um, and different systems for trying to combat some of the more negative things. Um, but I feel like I don't have time to go into detail about it right now. Um, but now I'm TX's question, is there solidarity from other or sympathy? Was the word sympathy, empathy from other yeah, how, how, how do they see? How do they see this? This. Uh... I mean, TX probably knows more than I do because they just started this new union, um, and I would like to talk to them about it. But um, I feel I don't. Maybe this is an outdated view, but I kind of feel like people still see content creators or influencers as like not real laborers quite a lot of the time. So there's there's still this this sense that they're just like having fun online, um, and so maybe they won't maybe they don't get as much solidarity, um, especially as it's there's this kind of popular view of influencers as just having a lovely time, sitting around, doing luxurious things, getting free gifts, whatever, you know, it depends on the genre, but like it, it seems like a dream job in a lot of ways. Um, so maybe perhaps unions of ride sharing apps might not feel that much sympathy for content creators, but I don't know. I don't want to speak for, you know, it's, it doesn't really make sense to lump whole groups of workers into one thing. But I think that is a problem for a lot of creators that they're not really taken seriously. And that's what a lot of this work and like the influencer inquiry is trying to do to say, look, this is actually a really big industry. It's a serious form of labor. It's a really challenging form of labor. Um, and what was Jordan's question? Sorry. I'm, just <laughs> I'm really one, bad at remembering. Just one quick thing, which is that we, we, I'm sure someone has done some research in terms of how other activist okay. organizations, not just labor groups, but activist organizations have come to understand creators as allies. I know that okay. as a, uh, GLAAD, for example, has for years yeah. given out awards to creators who've been leading the latest evolution and kind of nice. rights challenges um, in the social media space. So I mean, they've been Splash on the cover of all the advocates and other queer magazines and queer rights magazines for years now right. in this space. So okay. I think a lot of activist organizations have, have yeah. moved more rapidly into understanding yeah. the social, culture, and political significance of what these creators mm -hmm. are doing, who are simultaneously also aligning around mm -hmm. capitalist mm -hmm. concerns. Jordan, the question uh, tackled uh, the point where you were saying uh, that. Uh, some creators choose to step back once they find um, those difficulties. If right. you, uh, well, there are ways that if, creators if, if there are, are that, that creators are actually mm. stepping in and finding loopholes, and if mm. those loopholes are worth it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are. I think there are a lot of different approaches here. Um, for example, I heard a lot of like, particularly in 2018 when I was first at VidCon in LA, I heard. LGBTQ plus creators talking about how they had started taking off any like um, reference to to queer culture in their tags and titles to try and like mitigate algorithmic discrimination. Um, so there are a lot of like little small small tactics like that that exist um, where people try to kind of circumvent the system. Um, there are many tactics to do with like trying to fit into more main, mainstream culture like. Um, the chapter I did with Sarah for your book, Creator Culture, was all with was about um, feminist content creators and how they kind of dial back their political, the overt political messages in order to still be appealing to brands. So there are a lot of things like that. Um, they're all kind of they all end up hurting the creators in the end because they they they're basically all tactics that involve like not kind of showing your true self in a sense, um, trying to hide aspects of yourself in order to not be discriminated against. That's, yeah. Sorry, but that's yeah, one more question, question. right, Lauren? Okay. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. So, so many threads to think about. Um, I want to ask something around uh, the transparency. I think you raised this point around the transparency of moderation and content moderation. And there's, I feel like there's been a push towards content, you know, transparency and how content moderation and algorithmic injustice is happening. But I'm wondering, and maybe this is a really optimistic proposal, and I wonder if this had come up in any of your field work, 
if there is a push towards transparency around monetization. And I, you mentioned, you know, that audiences and the way that audiences are commodified in different ways is largely how um, content creators make make their money. But what would it look like if we were to demand platforms to give us the numbers on how much each audience was worth? And like then maybe we'd be able to reflect on how are the platforms monetizing or putting placing value or uh, some type of fiscal value on various different yeah. groups. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I, I, it would be really interesting and really useful for us as researchers <laughs> <laughs> if we had access to any of these systems or how anything works. Um, yeah, that question, that that question about advertisers and how they they assign value to different audiences, I find so fascinating. Like. This is my little drum that I keep beating at the moment to do with CPMs or cost per mill. So like one one creator, I don't know how much time we have. We're over it. Oh, sorry guys, sorry. If anyone needs to leave, that's absolutely fine. Um, one creator, Hannah Witten, who is one of my like really great participants because she like has already thought about all of the things I wanted to ask and had really interesting answers for all of them. She's a sex education creator and she was talking to me about how the CPMs of her audience were lower. So the amount that advertisers will pay per a thousand views on her videos were a lot lower than her friends um, who made science, particularly white male friends who made science education content. They had compared their CPMs because they have access to it. So they individually, they know uh, how much they're paid per a thousand views on videos and it varies depending on the video. Um, she compared hers to her friends and it was like night and day. Like she was getting way, way lower money per a thousand views on her videos. And that was because of the demographic of her audience. Um, but as far as I understand, and there are probably other people who get this better than me, but I think how that works is like um, advertisers bid on slots based on the demographics of the audiences who are likely to be watching those videos, right? Um, so, and I think that's a very common mechanism right, in all advertising, um, which is very problematic, <laughs> but fascinating. And she, she had, what she had done there to try and mitigate that was she had a second channel, which was just for like advertiser friendly content. So it was her like, family vlogs, her kind of daily stuff with her kid and, and this kind of thing. She put it separate to her sex education channel because she, because her the, the videos on her sex education channel were always getting demonetized because she was talking about sex, I don't know, like, because that's not appropriate apparently for a lot of advertisers. Um, even though she it was like a really politically engaged channel that talked about lots of really important things and it had like a million subscribers, she was getting more money from her, her life, like her daily vlogging -y type channel, which only had 100,000 subscribers because of that discrepancy. But yeah, it would be really interesting if we had access. All that data together. It would be fascinating, yeah. yeah, yeah. If we could just get creators to share their, <laughs> their data, then maybe we could actually do a systematic analysis but yeah so thank you very much zoe it's been a pleasure and as thank always you. we've been treading down this path for a long time now and sharing lots of uh information back and forth thank you all for showing up today and everyone online and um i want to hand it over to you because i know we've got some more speakers coming in oh yeah. yes um, thank you for coming online you who are watching us live now and you who are present in the room feel free to come every wednesday at 12 from 2 1. please be aware of our calendar of the future speakers uh, very very exciting topics uh social media and beyond and i thank again our uh, moderator and our panelists dr zoe glad have a good one I should say, if anyone is wanting to talk more or get in touch, then please just, I mean, you can tell me right now or just send me an email. Just